<clears throat> In this video, I'd like to talk about how to solve some basic trig equations using the unit circle and inverse functions. And even though we're only going to look at some just simple equations here, it's the foundation for solving all trig equations. No matter how complicated a trigonometric equation is, it will always be distilled down to what we're about to do here. This will always be the final step. So it's really important that you get this foundation um, feeling good. So just to help us out, I've um, added the little our quadrant one of the unit circle here. And I wanna look at some basic equations using both the unit circle and inverse trig functions because we wanna make sure we can do both. So let's suppose that we were asked to solve um, two cosine of X minus root three equals zero. Now, when you're solving a trig equation, there's actually a couple different ways you can write your answer. We'll see that at the end. Um, and so usually the directions might say, find all real solutions, find the general solution, or maybe it just says, find all solutions in some window, like from zero to 360 degrees or zero to two pi. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. Anyways, when you you're solving a trig equation. The goal is always to isolate the trig function. Ultimately, we're trying to find angle x. And we know it's an angle because, again, we plug angles into our trig functions. So that's what we're trying to find. We start by isolating the trig function. So the root 3 we want to move over, and then we'll eventually, or next, we'll divide by the 2. So let's add the root 3 to the other side. It becomes positive. Now let's divide both sides by two, getting cosine of x is root three over two. Once your trig function is isolated, again, sine, cosine, tangent, whatever you're solving, once it's by itself, you gotta decide, can I use the unit circle to help me finish? Do I need to rely on inverse trig functions? Um, or maybe I could do either one. So looking at this ratio here, I see that that's a common one found on my unit circle. That's that, you know, my spidey senses go off and I go, oh, that's that's on the unit circle. When is cosine X equal to root three over two? What type of reference angle are we talking about? That's the pi over six angle, right? That's when the cosine is root three over two. So I know that any angle solution X here is gonna at least have a reference angle of pi over six. Um, so let's start trying to write those out. Let's look at our pi over six angle here. We know that's a good valid solution here. One thing we have to keep in mind is um, we also want to make sure we're satisfying the sign of the ratio. So remember, all students take calculus. We're looking for cosine to be a positive root three over two. Well, we can see from the unit circle that that occurs in quadrant one, right? Um, but we also see that cosine should be positive down here in quadrant four. So there's another solution down here in quadrant four um, that also gives a ratio of root three over two. And it would have to have a reference angle of pi over six, because those are the type of slices that make cosine root three over two. So what is this angle? If you were to go all the way around and you cut your pizzas into pi over sixes, two pi would be 12 of them, right? Because the 12 and the six would reduce to two pi. And so this was just one shy. I'd have to give one back. This would be 11 pi over sixes. So that's another legitimate solution. Now, there's actually infinitely many solutions because you got to remember coterminal angles. Any angle, no matter how many laps around the circle you take, if it stops on that terminal side, if it's pointing that direction, then it too was cut with those pi over six size slices. And therefore, cosine of that angle is going to yield root three over two. And since there's infinitely many coterminal angles, there's infinitely many solutions. So. How do we write our answers? Uh, if they want us to find all real numbers, or again, sometimes they'll call it find the general solution, then I want to list out 
these two angles I found, pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6. But I also need to account for all those infinitely many coterminal angles that land on those terminal sides. Those would also be solutions. So recall how we generate a coterminal angle. Don't we just add a lap around the circle? So if you're standing at pi over 6, I can get a coterminal angle by adding 2 pi or another 2 pi or another 2 pi. So remember, it's any integer multiple of pi. K is an integer. Same goes for the next solution. Uh, not only is 11 pi over 6 good, but anybody that points in that same direction, sorry, I guess they should be leaving from here. Anybody that points in that same direction is coterminal and therefore would also satisfy that equation. So 11 pi over 6 plus anybody coterminal there. So this would be the general solution. And it represent, represents infinitely many solutions. They might ask you to say, or they might say, find all solutions between some interval, usually um, like 0 to 2 pi. And usually they include either the 0 or 2 pi, and they exclude the other. That's why we have brackets, parentheses. Because if you remember, uh, they really represent the same point, right? So that way you wouldn't list your answer twice if that happened to be a solution. OK, so if they wanted you to only list the solutions between 0 to 2 pi, then you're literally just going to take one lap around the solution, uh, the circle and report back any solutions you find. So the answer would be the angle pi over 6 and the angle 11 pi over 6. Just those two. Those are the only two you would find in one lap around the circle. So do pay attention to the directions because it's going to determine how you answer the question. So we were able to do this using um, our unit circle uh, knowledge, but we can also, there's going to be times when we have to rely on inverse trig functions. And you can always use inverse trig to get the job done, though the unit circle approach I think is is faster um, and it gives us the benefit of becoming more and more familiar with our common angles and ratios. So I would always encourage you to use the unit circle method um, if you've got a ratio that works there, something you find on the unit circle. What if we have to use an inverse trig function? So let's try one more example and say we are asked to solve the equation um, 3 cosine x minus 1 equals 0. OK, so again, they didn't specify how they want our answer. We'll, we'll just give it both ways at the end. But if we're solving a trig equation, we've got to start by isolating the co uh, cosine function or whatever the trig function is. Ultimately, we're after that angle, but we start by getting the trig function by itself. So moving the 1 over and then dividing by 3. I get cosine of x equals one-third. Now, that is not familiar from our unit circle, right? If you look at the different cosine and sine values, and remember, these repeat all the way around the circle. They just change positive or negative. So none of them are one-third. So the unit circle method is no help here. We, we don't have a choice. We have to use an inverse trig function. OK, so we can make the jump. I could say x equals cosine inverse of that ratio, one third. Um, you might see in some videos where they they sort of take cosine inverse of both sides, and you know they cram it in here. That's not, I would say, not entirely appropriate notation. So I, I would encourage you just to go from the standard form and then jump to the in, inverse form. Um, okay. Well, I'd have to put this in the calculator, and I'm working in radians here. So if we do cosine inverse of one third, I get that x is roughly 1.23. Okay. Now, 
when you're in radians and you get a decimal, that's not easily identifiable on the, the circle often. So uh, sometimes I remind myself, you know, this guy's pi over two, uh, which if you put that in the calculator is about 1.57. So 1.23 is somewhere up there close. There's our angled solution. Now, if you notice from this last example, remember we found two places that satisfied our equation or two angles that satisfied our equation. When I put this in the calculator, I'm only getting one result out of there. So what gives, does this only have one solution? No, it's got more. And this is where you have to be extremely careful using inverse trig functions. It can become very easy, especially if this problem starts out really ugly and you got to work your way down that once we get to put things in the calculator and we get our answer, we're like, oh, I'm done. Thank, thank goodness. Move on. We're not done yet. Remember that when you invoke any inverse trig function, it's working on a restricted domain, right? Remember, we had to restrict the domain to make it one-to-one -one so that it can become an inverse function. So cosine inverse, if you recall, is only going to give us an answer in that window from zero to pi. Um, it's not even going to address anybody else because in the eyes of cosine inverse, that stuff doesn't exist. So yeah, we got an answer here, but what's going on down in these quadrants? So you must remember that when you use inverse trig, you're only getting half the picture. You've got to continue investigating and dig up uh, what's most likely going to be at least one more solution. Okay, so to do that, we just remember that all students take calculus, and I'm interested in my cosine function giving a positive result. Well, that happened in quadrant one because everybody's positive, but it's also going to happen in quadrant four. So to figure out that angle, I know that it's some angle in quadrant four that would have the exact same reference angle as this guy up here in blue. It's got a reference angle of roughly 1.23. So to figure out what angle it is, I would have to go all the way around. I could go all the way around the circle to two pi, and I could subtract off that reference angle that I overshot. Now I'm rounding a lot. You got to be careful when you round because when you round too aggressively and then use that to figure out something else and maybe round that result, your, uh, your accuracy can drop. So be careful. But let's figure out what that is. 2 pi minus 1.23 is about 5.05. .05. So it looks like this angle here would be 5.05 .05 radians. And again, that's how we got it. So I've got a second solution down here we got to list out. My solutions would be, well, if I want to write all real numbers, x would uh, be approximately, I'll just give a decimal, 1.23. But don't forget, it could also be anybody coterminal to that. Or x could be 5.05 .05, or anybody coterminal to that. And you really need to state what k is because what makes these coterminal is that k is an integer, you know, negative 3 or a negative 2 or a 5, 0, whatever, uh, but not a fraction or decimal. So you really need to state in the problem that k is an integer. Okay, so there's our general solution represents infinitely many solutions. If they wanted the solutions between 0 and 2 pi, well, again, that's just saying, all right, just take one lap around the circle and report back all the solutions you find. So in this case, it would be 1.23 and 5.05. .05. So you're going to solve a whole variety of trig equations in the class. And some will be 
ugly and complex and they'll require the use of identities and, and all this other stuff, but they are all going to eventually get down to this point or this point. They're all going to work their way down to um, this, where you have to either invoke the unit circle or the inverse trig functions to, to find your particular angle. Just remember, if you use inverse trig functions, the calculator's only going to tell you half the picture because of the domain restriction. You've got to go and fill in the other gap. All right? Good luck and keep up the good work.